this video we're going to talk about what to do when your GPS just won't cut it. This used to happen a lot in forestry canopies. The canopy, as it got denser and denser, our GPS uh, accuracy would drop until sometimes we couldn't get a signal. That doesn't happen as much with the additional GPS uh, networks that we have. Canyons are still a problem. Uh, you, you either can't get into the canyon to get the readings you need, or once you're in the canyon, your GPS just doesn't get a good fix. GPSs don't work underwater. Um, in small areas, if you don't have a submeter GPS, um, that can be a problem and um, there because the accuracy is so low on the recreational grade and you need to have if you need to have high accuracy in a small area like if you're mapping woody debris or you're mapping trees in a small area uh, the methods we'll cover here will help um, also you can see the features we can't get to them so bottom of a canyon across a stream part way up a cliff all of those are going to be situations where you're not going to be able to get to the gps to the location to take a gps reading um, so first, a few definitions. We're going to be taking a bearing. That is the direction to the target. Typically, we measure that with a compass. Um, that is also uh, sometimes referred to as a heading because it's often used as a direction of travel. Uh, GPS can provide a heading while you're finding an angle between your current location and previous one. Um, but its accuracy is not very good. It only works while it's moving. And it's just um, finding that angle. It's not actually measuring um, a direction based on the magnetic uh, orientation of the Earth. So the basic idea to do this to gather points is first you want to establish a benchmark. Uh, typically one with more accurate certainty or enough certainty um, that you're going to be good to go on the rest of your points uh, because your accuracy is going to go down as we shoot points. And often this is done with a GPS. Um, as we'll do in lab this week. Uh, then, from that benchmark, you shoot points, okay? You, you measure a distance and direction. This is also called meets and bounds in the surveying community, so there's a number of different terminology for this. I'm gonna try and, and do measure distance and direction, okay? I'll try and use that terminology, but be aware meets and bounds is the same thing, and we'll talk about a couple other terms. Uh, then we take that and we convert it to coordinates, Remember that we have to use a projected system for this. I regularly see students trying to do this in geographic. Your um, measurements will be way off. Uh, latitudes are 30% different from longitudes around Humboldt County, which immediately throws all your measurements really off. Um, also, remember that your accuracy decreases as you move from point to point. It will accumulate, and you'll probably see that in this lab. So again, the basic idea is that we have uh, an existing coordinate, I'm calling that x1, y1. So we're down here, and then we can use a compass to get an angle, which we're using theta here, okay, to our new coordinate. And then we can also measure a distance, which we'll use a rangefinder for that, but you can pace it off. You can use uh, tapes. The laser rangefinders we have today are relatively inexpensive and incredibly accurate. So they're very popular for this type of work. Um, now, the problem is to go from this coordinate to this one, we need to know the dx, dy, because these are x and y. We've got a theta, an angle, and a d for our distance, and we need to get to x2, y2. Uh, the equation for that is x2 equals x1 plus um, dx. Okay, so going from x1 over by dx to x2, same thing for going from y1 adding dy to get us up to y2 so that'll take us to our new coordinate problem is we need to be able to compute dx dy from theta and d well that's where trig comes in if you haven't heard the term SOHCAHTOA make a note of it now it's the most important word in trigonometry because if you have SOHCAHTOA in the back of your head as I have since 12th grade math, okay, uh, then you have the sine equals the opposite over hypotenuse, okay, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and then the tangent is the opposite over adjacent, yay, all there in one nice word. Um, now, I'm going to turn those into the opposite equals the sine times the hypotenuse, adjacent equals cosine times hypotenuse, and all I did there was multiply both sides of this equation by hypotenuse, and then rearrange, and you can see opposite is going to be equal to the sine times the hypotenuse, adjacent equal to the cosine times the hypotenuse. Then we can substitute our theta and our d, so we're taking the sine of theta times d, which is our hypotenuse, cosine of theta times d, 
and that's how we can get our dx dy. Or we come back here, you can see theta, we take the sine, that's the opposite, or dx over the hypotenuse, d. And so there's sine of theta times d. And then for the cosine, we take the cosine of theta, that's the adjacent, or dy, um, over d. Again, multiply both sides to solve for dy. We then get cosine of theta times d. So here's our equations for x2 and for y2. And we can put those equations into Excel. Sorry about the black boxes. I'm not sure where those are coming from. OK, to do this, uh, we need a direction. We get that typically from a compass. Uh, the Earth has a magnetic field. It has a north pole and a south pole. Uh, the pole is referring to magnetic poles, um, which is great. And we can use that anywhere on the Earth except the North and South Pole to determine our direction. Um, we do this with a compass. There's a lot of different types of compasses. Um, because we're all doing this independently, um, you know, those who get together uh, with me for face-to-face -face will be using compasses from Labstock, but others of you will be using different compasses. They're inexpensive. You can buy them on um, Amazon for about uh, less than $20. Um, I have several, so feel free to use your own. That's fine. Um, we just need to make sure that we're getting good, accurate numbers. Okay, these instructions are um, how to uh, get the instruction, um, get the compass heading with a very simple compass like this one that I used 20 years ago in Boy Scouts, where you turn the dial, okay, um, but you set this to be your direction of travel, which is typical with most compasses. You point them in the direction that you want to go, or or point them to where you are shooting the next point you want to go to. So you're standing at x1, y1. Then you point the compass at x2, y2, and you shoot that direction. So you'll orient the compass to be in that direction. Okay. Now some of them you then rotate the case until the case points north. Other ones you can just look into an eyepiece and see which direction that is. Okay. So you'll need to, to check the directions for the type of compass you're using to be able to set the direction. Um, to find the direction. I do have instructions here for the mirror sighting compasses. These are the ones we have in lab stock. Again, I'm going to leave you to measure, do a good measurement. The one thing I'm going to talk to you about is declination, because this is a big area for confusion, um, because magnetic north is not the same as geographic north. Those are two different things. Compasses measure magnetic north, all the maps and GS data we will be using assume that north is at geographic north, partly because it doesn't move. Magnetic north actually changes and moves over time. That's complicated. Uh, we want to use one that's not moving. So geographic north and south do not move. And there's more on this on, on Wiki. Um, check out some cool animations about how that has changed. But the basic idea is that when we measure north with our compass, it's going to be off by some amount and that is generally called declination, okay? And that means that our measurements here in Humboldt County are going to be low. The, the distances are going to be low because of the declination. In other words, the North Pole, magnetic North Pole is over here, geographic North Pole is over here, okay? So we're gonna be measuring based on this North Pole we need to add declination. The add is very important because other parts of the world will be subtracting. We need to add declination to get true North Pole, geographic North Pole. Okay, now you can do that with your compass. However, I do it in Excel because I don't want to worry about it when I'm in the field. I want to worry about it when I'm back in front of my computer in the office. When I'm in the field, I just want to worry about using my equipment in the most simple way possible. So one of the things we're going to need to do is we're going to need to be able to find our magnetic declination. I did a quick search for declination map and found here's a NOAA website about magnetic declination. And here's a tool from NOAA, which tells me it's probably a pretty good source, where I can just put in Arcata, California. It gives us a lat long. And then I can go ahead and calculate declination. So up here is our declination, okay, and it's saying 14 degrees, 16 minutes east, so I'm going to need to convert it to decimal degrees to, uh, to add it to our measurements, that's okay, and it also says it's plus minus 22 minutes, so that's kind of cool, we've got a, a 
accuracy of how good our declination is. Okay. Measuring distance. So there's lots of ways to measure distance. Um, this is what they used to do with optical distance measurements um, back in World War II. Kind of fun. Uh, this is more modern with um, a laser uh, measuring finder. In fact, I think that is the same one that we still have in lab stock. We also have some newer units, which we're going to be sending out to students, but some of you uh, here at HSU may be using the older ones. They work. The measurements are just as good. They're just a little bit more complicated to use. Uh, you can also use a lightweight measuring tape. That would be the next best. Uh, remember, you have to pull that tape tight, and that's why it's important to be lightweight, because otherwise, um, as it sags, you'll be getting a, um, shorter distances. You'll be measuring a longer distance than your actual distance, and you can actually compensate for that, but again, that makes things very complicated. Uh, when using the rangefinder, remember that modern rangefinders, um, they um, measure horizontal and vertical distance. They also will measure slope distance. We almost always deal with horizontal data only. When we're putting points on a map, that assumes everything is at the same elevation. It does not include vertical distance. We want to be using that horizontal distance, okay? The other distances, like vertical distance, can be important based on elevation. You can also get things like tree height from it, um, but we're mostly going to worry about horizontal distance. Um, in some cases, you want to use a leveling rod to be very accurate, and this is true of any um, rangefinder you're using. This is an old theodolite uh, that he's using, and so you can have a leveling rod so that you have your height above the ground here to be about five feet. Um, you can have a five foot leveling rod to make sure that you're measuring a horizontal angle. Less important with modern rangefinders because they have that horizontal one. Um, and I'm actually going to stop there because these instructions, which are in the PowerPoint, of course, cover how to use the older rangefinders in lab stock. And the videos that I've created with one of my graduate students, Holly, they uh, go over the newer ones. So we've got you covered in both cases. Okay.